Right, before we begin, can I please invite um, Kao Matua Jeff to bless the event? Tatamai,いたやたぴきまい。とかなまいとともまいらげとまはなはなわいるあいのがやたたか。けっぱやいてのほが。おがたいなめがとかないろといとかのがわいるあ。Manaki Time Gloria to Ingwa, Gloria to Ingwa Tapu Inga Makatwa. Amen. Tenala Tata Katwa, a wire to Chene Nakupu Tapu or Teatra, a Korwan Motata Katwa. Gate me here to Rakatata. Wakalongo get the tongue or the manu a Kalangane. Tui, 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 yam. Tui, I don't have to a laro. Along with the poor, along with the hour, it's a caller, it's a putaka taka, a tap stone, who are taka taka, who are fear fear. A malama who nuku, a malama who rangi, go to go to get a home, no two to win you any, two to one a man. Baka put out to get the fire, get the hour, malama, malama get the rangi, two e hone, malama get the papa, toko, two ruki, two ruki, anneke, panneke. I
Tau mai a te atua o manao ki tanga i rongi tō tātou kēngi, a kēngi tū hei tia pō tō tau, te whero whero te tua whitu. Te whara kākoreke i whānui tūnu, lirea i pai māre i tūki te whara kākoreke. He mehi kawana o tira ki o tātou tini ai tua maha. Ko hinga atu e hinga nei i wainga nui a tātou. Mai roto e te tau tawhito huri kau mai rā i roto i tēnei tau hau. Kau tau te hunga wairua e moe o ki o ki e moe i te wāhi mau mahara. A hoki mai rā kia ngai tātou, te pitu ola kia tātou i tēnei ahi ahi. A re mai, nau mai, piki mai, kake mai rā. Kake mai i roto o ngā ati whātua whānui, tāmaki mā kourau, tāmaki here here. A re mai rā. A re mai, noho ngā tahi mai i laro i te tui nui o te whare langatira, e me nāki nei i a ngai tātou te hingoala i tēnei ahi ahi pō. A re mai, a re mai i roto i tēnei whare wānanga. Pago ko tahi ai tātou, e pāna ki te kaupapa. A me tāku mōhio, ko te kaupapa tino langa tira la wātū tēnei. O te kaupapa e longo hi ake nei tōna wairua. A whakamālama tiai i te taha ka tau, ki te taha Māui. Kia mōhio tātou, i te hoki oki tātou ki o tātou wā kāinga ki o tātou tamariki, ki o tātou hoa tāna ki o tātou hoa wāhine. I roto i te kapu o te ringa, ko te mātou langa. Me ngā whakamālama tanga e pāna ki tēnei kaupapa i tēnei ahi ahi pō. A re mai ngā mana ne take taki. A re mai. A re mai. E mehi kawana e hotu ana te manawa. O tira ki tēnā lōpū e longa hi ake nei ngā whātō pito o te ao. E huri kau ana lā te mau mahala kia lā tau. I roto i te wai paunamu, uri i noa i te motu, lā tau kia lā tau. E pēnei ana te āwhuatanga, ngā mata ki ngā mata. Ane mai, ane mai, ane mai koutou. Ane mai koutou i roto i te āwhuatanga o te kaupapa, Abdul, A nei rā ka kolo piko atu nei, a tēnei o i wāinga nui tīwi. Wāinga nui tīwi. A longo hea te reo o koutou, e wai ata tia nei tēnei hīmene. E hīmene tino wairua. E hīmene, e hea kai ano koutou ki te whaka mōhio, ki te whaka mālama hi ai, te kaupapa kei mūi a tātou. Piki mai, hare mai rā. O ti rā te whaka haere o tēnei pō, e te mihi atu rā. Me pēnei a kei pēa e koro mā, E koe i mā, wāhine mā, tāne mā, are mai. Are mai ki tāmaki mā koulau. Are mai anō lā i te whare wānanga, kia wānanga nanga hea kotahi tātak. Are mai rā, are mai. Nō reira kia koutou, kia tātou katoa. Tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. E hāi te mea, anō nāi nei, 
te aroha anonga tu puna tu kui ho tu kui ho e hara e te me anona yone te aroha anonga tu puna tu kui ho No let up at your horn or tata hono lato calato. A could I tongue your hair, my my yarn or hock and lato? A could I hear your tongue your hair, my my yarn or can I tatanga mahuiho? Would you know, would you know, then I'll go to, then I'll go to, then I'll tata cutter. We just elbow tapped. It's just sign of the times, isn't it? Um, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Welcome, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. Can you hear me? Right. On behalf of the Pearl of the Islands Foundation, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this panel session titled Post-Christchurch Hate Speech, Political Discourse and Religious Diversity, What Lies Ahead? My name is Hyria. I'm a senior lecturer here at AUT, and I will be your MC for this evening. Once again, on behalf of the Pearl of the Island Foundation, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we are meeting on. I acknowledge the Maori, their elders, past and present, and pay our respects to the Maori community of New Zealand. It is our great honor and privilege tonight to welcome you all here and we want to thank you so much for coming. Pearl of the Islands Foundation is a non-profit organization that works comprehensively to celebrate diversity and advance social cohesion in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Their mission is to foster understanding and acceptance between people of diverse communities through meaningful interaction and intercultural events. PIF, Pearl of the Island Foundation, does community engagement and outreach programs through a number of intercultural dialogue-based events, such as Ramadan iftar dinners, talks, and panels. We are grateful for the support we have received from AUT for providing the venue and the Ethnic Communities Development Fund for making tonight possible. Additionally, we would like to thank the Hadija leadership Network and Religious Diversity Centre for endorsing tonight's program as well. Now for a brief coronavirus message. Um, it's been a devastating few weeks and we pray for the end of the pandemic. Uh, please observe social distancing where possible and uh, please understand if there are those of us who would rather not make any kind of contact We'll just put our hand to our hearts, if that's all right with you. Um, right, I'd like now to invite Abdul Jalil Gerlim, Community Engagement Director at the Pearl, um, at, of the Pearl of the Islands Foundation, um, to give the official welcome. Abdul Jalil Gerlim, please. Tēnā kato, tēnā kato, tēnā kato katoa. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to begin my speech to welcome, with, welcome you with Islamic greeting of Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be upon you. On behalf of Pearl of the Islands Foundation, it is my great honor to warmly welcome each and every one of you to this evening panel. And also, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of you for participate, participating in this event. I would like to thank the Auckland University of Technology, Religious Diversity Center, and Khatija Leadership Network for supporting this event. I would like to thank and acknowledge Professor Spoonley, former Pro Vice Chancellor of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, at Massey University, who will be keynote speaker for tonight. I also acknowledge our four panelists, Professor Douglas Pratt, Professor Edwina Pio, 
Ms. Anjum Rahman and Professor Peter Leineham. Welcome. I would like to specially acknowledge, he will be with us, I saw him this afternoon, Brother Farid Ahmed, peace advocate and role model for the Muslim community and abroad. He came from Christchurch to share his reflection with us, and also he wrote a book about Christchurch incident and about his wife, her name is Husna. I would like to also acknowledge Dr. Andrew Kettling, head of the Vice Chancellor Department, Office of AUT, Jocelyn Armstrong, Chair of the Religious Diversity Center Trust, Ms. Tayyip Khan, co-founder and CEO of Khatija Leadership Network. She will be moderator of the panel. Thank you. Pearl of the Islands Foundation aims to promote dialogue, acceptance, and meaningful engagement between people who may not necessarily identify with the same nationality, culture, or religion. These interfaith in the cultural spaces are very important in this regard. They allow for meaningful exchanges with people we may not necessarily be familiar with. By engaging in conversation with people around us, we shatter stereotypes and attempt to understand and accept each other. As you know, the horrific attacks in Christchurch on 15th of March 2019 have devastated all of us. No matter what their religious or ethnic identities are, any attempts to take the life of an innocent person is an attack against sanctity of human life and against all of humanity. Everyone and every creature have the rights to live in, in the society. According to Quran, whoever kills an innocent soul equals the slain of mankind entirely. And whoever saves once equals the slain of mankind, uh, save of mankind entirely. I hope Prime Minister of New Zealand principles and inclusive stance will remind us of our common human identity and serves as an example to other national leaders in addressing challenging situations such as the Christchurch attack and others that happen in the past, recent past. At the same time, I hope that these deplorable events will urge us to question why and how prejudice, fear, and hate have been on the rise and seek solutions together. We organized this panel in light of the one year anniversary of the Christchurch ethics. We also made a trip to Christchurch last week to deliver vouchers to victim families as part of a fundraising drive from last year. I would like to end my speech to supplication, pray for all the deceased during the, these difficult times. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful. Praise be to the Lord of the universe who has created us and made us into the tribes and nations that we may know each other and help each other, not that we may despise each other. Our Lord, unite us and our nation around the principle of love, justice, faith, and peace. Put peace and love in our hearts for the diversity that makes our nation so beautiful. Most merciful of the merciful, we pray for our nation to remain tolerant, acceptance, loving, remove prejudice from our hearts, and allow us to love our brothers and sisters in humanity. Allow our leaders to remain accountable to the people, give them vision and mission, wisdom, as they take decision affecting peace in our nation. O oh Lord Almighty, Give us the strength to protect and care for our neighbors. Make our hearts so generous that we may treat communities and societies as we wish ourselves. 
O oh Lord, most merciful, most generous, please give us patience to continue to learn from one another and work towards a more peaceful and kind world. O oh Lord, we remember all 51 persons who were killed and lost their lives on 15th of March, and we pray for their families. I also extend my condolences to those who lost their loved ones due to the coronavirus that has spread around the world and resulted in the death of thousands. I pray for the speedy recovery of those who are ill. Therefore, I urge everyone to pray for the health and safety of humanity at this difficult time. May God, the most compassionate, save humanity from this pandemic, cure those who are ill, and give perseverance to those who lost their loved ones. May he help all those who are fighting against this pandemic, including healthcare workers, state officials, and volunteers all around the world. Amen. I greet everyone with my deepest respect and a big thank you to all of you for attending this panel in this hard time. Thank you very much again. Right, thank you very much, um, Mr. Gerlim. It's time now to introduce our keynote speaker. Distinguished Professor Paul Spoonley was until recently the Pro Vice Chancellor of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences at Massey University. He's the author or editor of 27 books, the most recent being Rebooting the Regions 2016. He's currently writing two books, one on social and demographic change in New Zealand, while the other concerns the extreme right in this country. He's a program leader of a research program on the impacts of immigration and diversity in Aotearoa with a funding of $5.5 million. He was made a fellow of the Royal Society of New Zealand in 2011 and was granted the title of Distinguished Professor by Massey University in 2013. He was awarded the Science and Technology Medal by the Royal Society in 2009 and he was a Fulbright Senior Scholar at the University of California, Berkeley in 2010. And since 2013, he has been a visiting researcher at the Max Planck Institute for the Study of Religious and Ethnic Diversity in Gottingen, Germany, most recently in 2019. It gives me great pleasure <laughs> to now invite distinguished Professor Paul Spoonley to the stage as tonight's keynote speaker with his talk title, Hate Speech, What Have We Learned Since 15 March and What Can We Do Now? He poe poe ao ao takiri mai te ata kore hita manu kau 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 te a e na manu na waka na reo o na manu fenu a na tifa tu a te na kau te e te kama tu a na mihi kia koe e hua ma kiora mai ano te na kau te te na kau te kiora tata kato salam alaikum shalom thank you for the invitation to speak tonight. And I want to acknowledge a very esteemed panel that's going to speak alongside me. Uh, and I want to just acknowledge our visitor who's just arrived for his and the community's wisdom and humility in very difficult circumstances. Um, as we remember what happened a year ago, just over a year ago, um, it is very, very difficult to know the words to, to express particularly to those who are directly affected by what has happened. So all I can say is that um, uh, to echo the Prime Minister, you are one of us and it is very important that we keep saying that. Look, I've got uh, about 10 minutes to, to say some words which I hope offer um, some insight, but not necessarily hope. Um, what I, want to, uh, what I want to suggest is that I was asked to talk about what was different about post-Christchurch. And in terms of the work that I've been doing around uh, hate speech, I'm not sure that pre-Christchurch and post-Christchurch are that different, to be honest. And Andrew and I were part of a meeting between the Muslim leadership of uh, New Zealand 
and various government departments in 2017. Um, February, wasn't it, Angela? I keep forgetting. <laughs> March, oh, I, I've forgotten already. Um, and um, in, that, in that meeting, there were some, some things that were said to our leaders of our government departments uh, who appear not to have been, those comments appear not to have been heard. And then in mid-2017, um, I chaired a, a, a group that was looking at hate speech in this country. And what happened was that uh, mid that year, of course, um, Lawrence Southern and Stephen Molyneux arrived here, and suddenly the interest in hate speech evaporated and we got a, um, a focus on free speech. So I want to acknowledge the um, Pearl of the Islands Foundation for, for arranging this, because I think we need to keep talking about it. And the questions that I was asked to address is whether or not hate speech has become normalised, any word yes, I think it has. Um, what's the social harm that's been caused and how can we respond to it? What has happened when you look at what's, what has happened around the world um, is that you've seen an escalation in online hate speech, particularly since 2016. And it's quite extraordinary. It doesn't matter where you go, whether you look at the work that's been done by Hadaya or the work that's been done by the Anti-Defamation League, it's the same message. And that is on year on year, there's been an escalation in the amount of um, hate speech that is available. And of course, the factor that's changed really has been the uh, possibility of the internet. And I would just like to, I would just like to invite all of us Whatever we do in our daily lives, we must understand that the world is changing enormously because of what the internet has done to it and that there's a, not only a technological transformation, but there is a philosophical and a political transformation that's happening. The problem is not free speech. The problem is an excess of information and the growth of that information has privileged opinion over fact. So that the second part of what's happening is that the volume of material uh, has just increased. And so the world that I do research in, my, my first book on, on the far right in New Zealand was published in 1987. And what's happened to that world of hate is that it has expanded as the internet has expanded. So it makes it very much harder to reach a consensus unless we can talk to one another. Because if our talk, if our conversations are mediated by the internet, then we're in um, some trouble. Because not only has the internet and the world of the internet, the digital world, not only has it increased um, the possibilities for extreme groups, but it's also increased other things, the, the degree of scepticism. There is often a low level of trust in our core institutions, including the media. So we have these very alternative information sources, and I'm putting quotation marks around that, in which there's no moderation. And one of the things that I have to do as part of my research for this book is look at the dark web. And it's a deeply depressing place, and it's one that you know you come out of and thinking, where can I get some um, fresh air and light in my world. Um, and you will have probably heard about 4chan and 8chan, but there's a whole lot of websites. And what's, what's happening is that these websites are now on decentralized platforms like ZeroNet, which are hosted by the users. So um, I'm going to talk in a second about the, um, how the main online platforms have reacted. But these are not platforms that are subject to material being taken down or moderated or reacted to. They are self-determining in every sense of the word. And of course, what's happened in that world is that disinformation, defamation, racial vilification has increased. Um, I've been um, influenced, and I've brought one of the books along. I've been very influenced by a book that came out last year by Nazreen Malik. We need new stories challenging the toxic myths behind our age of discontent. And Nazreen and another um, writer who I really do value, Rennie Eldo Lodge, she wrote a book, um, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race. The, the title's very provocative. It's a very good book. Um, the, both of them argue that 
the idea that somehow free speech is under threat at the moment and the sort of enlightenment values of open debate um, is being threatened uh, is, is really incorrect. And both of them argue that what's happening is that these extreme views and the people, the activists who, who advocate for them are wanting to secure the right to speak without impunity. Um, so it's simply not only more speech, but that somehow bigotry has become a legitimate point of view. And um, that when they don't get the right to speak, it leads to outrage. The other thing that I think has happened is that we've, we're starting to get new arguments occurring. And I don't know whether many of you have um, seen or heard about the Renal Camus book, uh, which was published in French in 2011 and English in 2012, in which he argued that the white Western world was being reverse colonized by non-whites. And he talks about the Great Replacement. And of course, that great replacement idea has been now central to many of the politics that we've seen emerge. Can I come to the second question that the um, uh, Pearl of the Islands Foundation asked me to address, and whether or not uh, this speech is having an impact upon our community? And, and the 15th of March tells us immediately it has. I mean, I think the answer to that is, is, is um, self-obvious. Um, but there's also now very good research, particularly in Europe and the United States, in which the increase in hate speech has real-world impacts. For some of us who wrote about what happened a year ago uh, in the last few days, I know Anjum has and, and others have, um, we get people responding to what we're saying um, with hate. And for me, what is difficult talking to many New Zealanders is that they s do not understand what the impact of that is on communities. And of course, it is largely invisible to them. But there's some very good research in Europe which shows that the increase in hate speech online leads to hate crimes. And when there's outages in the internet, there is a decline both in hate speech and also in hate crimes. How do we know what's happening in New Zealand? We don't. All we know is the experience of the people, some of whom are in this room, in terms of being the targets of hate speech. Many New Zealanders, most New Zealanders, are not, do not experience hate speech because Many of them, of course, are not members of ethnic and religious minorities. I would dearly love us to have material that is available in other countries around exactly what is happening online, particularly in this fraught area. NetSafe action stations do a great job and are telling us a little bit, but we've got a complaints-based system or a system that responds to individuals, and even then possibly not adequately. We don't know the extent of hate speech. So in answer to one of the other questions, is it growing, is it declining? My sense is it's growing, but we don't have very hard evidence of that. There are some good, uh, good examples, by the way, of communities and organisations responding to this hate speech. Um, I'm in c uh, contact with Tell Mama, which is a British um, organisation which is doing a fantastic job. Um, there's remote hate, remove hate from the debate, uh, all together now, online hate prevention, and there's the Unmanifesto campaign, which is a really interesting um, organisation which takes the manifestos of these hate groups and changes them. So. NetSafe, action stations, the e-safety research, if we want a sense of what's happening out there, um, the Human Rights Commission, Kororo, uh, Whakamaua Hawara, the hate speech, are all places where you can begin to understand what hate speech does in contemporary New Zealand. Can I finish just by um, talking really about some of the things that um, I think need to be contested. 
Um, the first is that um, in opposition to hate speech, as we found with Lauren Southern and Stephen Molyneux, was that free speech arguments were made. There's no such thing as free speech in this country. There are all sorts of restrictions on speech. And I find it ironic that parliamentarians talk about the importance of free speech when in the House their speech is limited in all sorts of ways um, that even you and I uh, don't experience. So the first thing I would like to argue very strongly is that we don't have unlimited free speech, we have all sorts of restrictions. The second myth, I think, is that it's too hard to define hate speech. No, it's not. Um, um, I, I wrote a, when, when I was chairing this, this group, I wrote a little paper and I looked at all the defi definitions of hate speech. I'd be quite happy to use the definition of Facebook. It's got a perfectly good definition of hate speech. Um, there's nothing wrong with our Section 61 of the Human Rights Act, except it's not inclusive. It doesn't include a whole lot of groups that should be included. And the Minister's signalled that he's going to, to look at that. So let's be up front and say that hate speech is not part of our community. The third myth, I think, is that somehow hate speech is not a threat to our society and to particular communities in it. It absolutely is. And I think you're going to hear from one or two other speakers who will definitely make that point. Hate speech and its escalation, particularly since 2016, is one of the issues that we should come together as a community and say it is not r acceptable for members of our community to face racial or religious vilification in any way, shape or form. Let's talk about the threshold, let's talk about the severity test that we need to apply, because we don't want to limit um, debate, but we definitely need to have that debate and to realise that it is having an impact on the safety and the well-being of members of our community. I think the fourth thing that we need is greater literacy, in particular digital literacy. I think we need to be able to understand what is happening on the internet and to be able to respond to it. I don't think legislation is the answer, but I think it's part of the answer. So I'm very supportive of the Minister Andrew Little and what he's trying to do to increase the protected characteristics. But legislation and criminal prosecution should be part of the array of weapons that we have. But it might, in my view, it should not be the first or the most important array. What we need is to be talking as communities to one another, to bear in mind what happened after the 15th of March and has happened again more recently, and to begin to talk. Because one of the things that I'm very clear about is that if we talk to each other online, it's not going to work. We need to talk in other ways. So digital, digital literacy. Despite that rather pessimistic uh, view of hate speech and whether it ha has increased or decreased, my view is that it has continued as much the same prior to um, the 15th of March 2019. It continues much the same now. And I think what we've got to do is recognise that the ecology, the opportunities for hate speech are now very different from what they were five or 10 or 20 years ago. So we need new weapons in our, arp in our armory. It's probably a bad example to use. We need new strategies to respond, um, to, respond to, to what's happening. And when I um, wrote the uh, piece for um, the group that I was chairing at the time, one of the things that I wanted to um, look at, and which I think we need to come back to, is to begin to look at what those other strategies look like. What are we going to do to minimise, uh, neutralise hate speech? And I think this community is small enough, this community being New Zealand, this community is small enough, it has good leadership, and I'm including their political leadership, and when I say political leadership, I mean also in the religious communities. I think we have an opportunity to lead the world in this new age of digital hate. And I will keep using the word hate 
because it is hate and we need to recognise it as such and we need as a community to say it is not all right. Kia ora tata katoa. Thank you very much, distinguished Professor Paul Spoonley. Ladies and gentlemen, an event like this brings people of different backgrounds together for the primary purpose of relating with each other on our common values. If you look around the room, you'll see diverse people from different segments of society. Um, before we move on to the panel discussion, we will have a very short break with refreshments. Um, and there's also space outside uh, for people who'd like to do their prayers. So please, welcome to some refreshments. Right, we come now almost to the panel session. Uh, before we do that, I'd like to introduce our moderator, um, Taiba Han, founder and CEO of the Hadija Leadership Network. Um, Taiba's uh, Fakapapa of forced displacement inevitably led to two decades of serving migrant and refugee communities in government and third sector roles. Having now lived and worked in New Zealand, Palestine, Australia and the UK with the opportunity to apply her interdisciplinary qualifications of mental health and international development in practice, Taiba is deeply passionate about her work with minority and faith-based communities. Her latest voluntary passion includes building up Hadija Leadership Network and representing the European Muslim League as their New Zealand Ambassador for Peace. Congratulations on that. Please welcome our moderator for the panel session, Taiba Han. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Tena koto, tena koto, tena koto, tato katoa. Um, welcome everyone. It is my immense pleasure to be your moderator for this evening. Um, can I please invite the esteemed panelists to join me on stage? Um, now <laughs> would be great. <laughs> I will introduce them, but I would like them to sit on stage. Oh, any order is fine. Yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you. So as you heard um, from Pro Professor Paul Spoonley, March 15th has um, changed many things for the Muslim community. Um, and we have an esteemed um, group of panelists here today who want to talk about a number of things from their expert perspectives for you all to listen, listen, listen and reflect upon. Uh, and they range from hate speech, political discourse, and religious diversity, and what lies ahead. Uh, how the panel will run, um, and really this is about a conversation. Uh, they have actually given us their time um, and have prepared their presentations for you tonight so that you can engage with them. Um, they are also very popular people, so I'm sure a lot of you are here so that you can have the opportunity to speak to them and to not only hear their insights, but to engage with them on that. Um, so I'm, I'll start by introducing um, the panelists uh, and give you a brief bio of who they are. Uh, how the panel will work is that we'll start from one speaker and then I will come to the floor and give you an opportunity to ask questions. Um, and we'll take about two questions and then go to the next speaker. This is just so we're keeping you engaged and you're not just sitting there listening um, consistently for about an hour. Um, so I hope that works for everyone and I know that will work for them. Um, they really are here to, to interact with the audience tonight. So I'll start off with um, Professor Edwina Pio. She is the Fulbright alumni. Dr. Edwina Pio is New Zealand's first professor of diversity and university director um, of diversity at AUT. Her research encompasses the intersection, intersections of work, ethnicity, indigenous studies, religion, and pedagogy. A thought leader, 
recipient of a Duke of Edinburgh Fellowship, judge of the New Zealand Diversity Awards, widely traveled and published. She's known for her praxis and action and rationally compassionate work on diversity and inclusion and its many facets in a volatile world. Many aspects of Adbina's life, um, life worlds have been structured by complexity of being a scholar of color and a passionately engaged ethnic minority migrant woman educator. Wow, that's, that's a lot. In October 2019, she received a Royal Society Medal for her work on diversity. Professor Edwina Pio. <laughs> Next to her, we have Professor Douglas Pratt. Professor Douglas Pratt taught religious studies um, at the University of Waikato for over 30 years, retiring in mid-2018. And when he says retiring, he doesn't really mean that. And I'll explain that in the bio. Uh, following the disestablishment of the religious studies program, currently he holds appointments as honorary professor in the theological and religious studies program um, of the University of Auckland and adjunct professor Theology and Interreligious uh, inter Relations in the Faculty of Theology, University of Bern, Switzerland. He's also an honorary senior research fellow, University of Bergen, Ber Birmingham, UK, uh, adjunct professor, uh, religion and law in the Faculty of Law, the University of Fiji, an associate researcher with the Centre of study, uh, for the Study of Religion and Politics, University of St. Andrews, Scotland recently elected as a fellow of both the Royal Historical Society and of the Royal Asiatic Society. His research interests include Christian-Muslim relations, interfaith dialogue, and contemporary issues in religion. Professor Douglas Pratt. <laughs> Next to him, we have Ms. Anjum Rahman. Anjum is the project lead for Inclusive Aotearoa Collective Tahono, an organization working to develop a national strategy on belonging and inclusion. She's also acting head and media spokesperson for the Islamic Women's Council of New Zealand. She's dedicated to breaking down the stereotypes about Muslims and about Muslim women in particular and improving the lives of migrant women through advocacy and practical support. Anjum was involved in setting up Sharma, Hamilton Ethnic Women's Centre, 16 years ago and remains heavily involved. She's a member of the Waikato Interfaith Council and on the governance board of the local funder Trust Waikato and the community access broadcaster Free FM 89. Ms. Anjum Rahman. <laughs> and last but certainly not the least, um, Professor Peter Lynham. Uh, Peter, uh, Professor Peter Lynham is Professor Emeritus, um, meaning that he has retired uh, from his role as Professor of History at Massey University and Regional Director of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, but remains associated with the university in an honorary role. He's a respected scholar whose interests cover a range of subject areas that can closely be ca categorised under history and religion. He was awarded membership in the New Zealand Order um, in the Order of New Zealand in the New Year's Honour list in 2019, and is well known for many of his published works. Professor Peter Lynham. <laughs> so, with that, um, we will have uh, we will have the speaker come to the podium, uh, and once uh, Professor. Uh, Professor Douglas Pratt has spoken. We will actually have two volunteers roaming around with the mic on the floor, and that's how we will operate. So with that, can I invite Professor Douglas Pratt? Thank you. Tēnā um, tato katoa. Salam alaikum. Peace be with us all. We are delving into a very important topic. Can I just move this? I don't know who this is. I'm going to put... <laughs> right. And I've only got a few minutes to speak, so I'm going just to make a few points about three topics within our field. They kind of connect. The first thing that's come to my mind is, is thinking about the New Zealand of... the context of New Zealand, of Aotearoa New Zealand, and this notion of free speech which is in the air that gets being talked about and is used to counter any suggestions that we should watch out for hate speech. 
seems to me, in part anyhow, came in with 19th century immigrants from the UK mainly, who classified themselves as non-conformists and free thinkers. And New Zealand was seen as a haven for non-conformists and three free thinkers. That is, people who wanted to pursue an alternative religious or non-religious identity over against the context of Britain, where they'd come from, where you have a state church and all that kind of thing. And so that's one element, this notion of, of, um, of non-conformists, of free thinkers. That was a, a, an identity. And they asserted the right to hold and give expression to a unique religious identity and not be subsumed under the status quo that they had left. This right, of course, did not include, that the right that was claimed, to include the carte blanche allowance to denigrate others and others' identities, although that happened, of course, but the right was not there for that because that was to deny what they were claiming for themselves. This kind of notion about free thinkers, non-conformists, free speech, became entrenched within New Zealand's emerging social policy as a modern nation state. It's part of the foundation of New Zealand's secular identity. That is, a level playing field for all. No one religious group, no one political group, can claim to rule over others. It's a level playing field. Okay. The concept of free speech that thus originated in a context of allowing for differences of political and religious views and identities to be openly held without fear of sanction. Fair enough. Thus, for example, one could hold, argue or hold a position against the status quo without being labelled either treasonous or heretic. Now, those words don't get used much today, but that's where it came from. And just giving you an example, the Methodist Church, one of the churches, groups that came out to New Zealand, it wasn't that long before where when the annual conference was held in Britain, one of the first motions that the conference passed was fealty to the crown because they were seen as a non-conformist, free-thinking group and, of course, in an, any kind of authoritarian state... A non-conformist, a free thinker, is dangerous because they could be treasonous. So a group like that declared, no, no, we're loyal to the Queen, thank you, Mum, and then got on with the business. Okay. So that that kind of that came into the New Zealand context as well. So holding a position, arguing for it. But note, the focus here is to argue, to have an opinion backed by evidence or rational argument, which in turn can be subject to evidentiary checking and rational scrutiny. That's what free speech is. Not saying what you like, but saying something that might be different to what other people are saying, but you have a reason for saying it. And that reason can be subject to scrutiny. Today, I fear too many people to presume free speech is simply a right to be able to give voice to whatever I think or feel without consideration of evidence or rationality. This is the realm of pure prejudice and ignorance, of pure opinion masquerading as meaningful utterance backed by a warped notion of absolute right. That's my first thing. The second thing I want to say just briefly is this. I want to touch on a religious term that will be known to hopefully quite a number of us, the Torah. The Torah meaning the first five books of the Bible. The Torah meaning the first Semitic expression of the word of God. The Torah, which has been um, interpreted as law, but really means the way. Within this way can be found the 613 commandments that Orthodox Jews believe God gave to Moses to instruct the people of Israel about what is and how it is to live as a human being. Best known, of course, is the Ten Commandments, more offered, honoured in the breach, not the observance. However, there is an interesting dimension. A number of these commandments are couched in the negative, thou shalt not. But embedded in every negative is a positive implication. One such commandment is pertinent to the question of free speech. You shall not bear witness against, bear false witness against your neighbour. It's commandment eight or nine, depending on the listening. 
You shall not bear false witness against your neighbour. The positive implication is that we are enjoined to bear true witness, to speak truly and respectfully of and to our neighbour. So for any Christian, for example, who takes seriously the guidance of Scripture, and you do not have to be a naive fundamentalist for this to be so, then the way, the Torah, we are to regard and relate to our religious and cultural neighbour is clear. Learn the truth of who they are and honour it, even if there is disagreement in detail. By all means, inquire, debate and argue, but on the basis of common ground of knowledge and understanding, on an equal footing of respect, all else is false witness. The implication for free speech is clear. And this brings me to my third point. The right to free speech was asserted by an anti-Islamic hate speech flyer entitled Muslims Have Been Deceived that emerged in New Zealand following the Christchurch Mosque at Masco 2019. It was placed on the windscreens of cars of the congregations of two prominent churches in Palmerston North one Sunday morning soon after the mosque attacks. These congregations had been prominent in their support of the local Muslim community. Four things to note quickly about this flyer. It was authoritative looking, but utterly false and misleading. It gave a summary, a misleading summary of Muhammad's biography, including the egregious comment, he turned to a life of crime. State of boredom, bluntly. It displays a classic fundamentalist, or what I might prefer nowadays to say, absolutist inability to understand language and its usage, including the difference between literal and figurative language. I find today the, it's, there's an abysmal lack of understanding the nuance of language, the way language functions in our society. As a result, you have false proof texting contrast. I mean, this is classic. You find all the texts you don't like about the other one, and all the texts you like about your own, and put them out and say, see, I told you so, we're better than you. That kind of thing. But quite nicely done. Reinforced in the leaflet by underlining certain phrases. In the result, asserting that Islam itself is a doctrine of hate and itself is a declaration of war. What disturbed me even more so was its reference to the New Zealand Human Rights Act and the Crimes Act to justify the comments made as being accurate and that therefore they were not, this leaflet was not itself hate speech. We're just simply saying what is true and claiming under the um, Human Rights Act that's okay. But the Crimes Act was used to, in, to attack those who support Muslims and they're coming to New Zealand as committing treason. It's stated. This is a direct parallel to the language and justification of Anders Breivik's actions in Norway 2011. 2011. It abets the ideological perspective used to justify and contextualize the March 15, 2019 mosque attack. I myself was a subject of this kind of attack after Christchurch last year. I was accused of being responsible for Sri Lanka because of the comments I had made, amongst other things. Quite bizarre. Anyhow, this leaflet is but one example of maliciously false and misleading claims about Islam circulating today. And I've heard this kind of thing said in a variety of quarters. This approach, of course, is not about engagement and understanding. It's about denigration and rejection. Such comments do not express acceptance and respect. They reflect what I call the trap of culpable ignorance. Culpable ignorance, choosing not to actually consider another point of view or look for the truth. They are not free speech. They are, in fact, hate speech in action. Wherever and however they appear, they need to be resisted and challenged. And that's what we have to do for the future. Thank you. Excellent on timing. I'm glad that's not, <laughs> that's, not some, that's not something I have to police. Thank you so much, Professor Douglas Pratt.
Um, in your words today, too many people presume free speech is a right to be able to give voice to whatever I think or feel without consideration of evidence or rationality. Thank you for your whakaro, thank you for your thoughts and reflections. I will now um, call on my two lovely volunteers to maybe just roam around with the mic and give you all an opportunity to ask a question or two with what you've just heard. And the panel is more than welcome to also pitch in, if you like. <laughs> Kia ora. Uh, thank you for your uh, speeches so far. Um, I would like uh, to see what strategies that we as individuals can do, like, like in the way that we try and combat uh, coronavirus by hand washing and all that. What can we do in terms of combating hate speech and also uh, strengthening the voice of um, minority communities, particularly uh, Muslim faith, in get it into the New Zealand law. Is this working? Is it, can you hear me? Yeah, it's okay. No, thank you. I, I'm glad you mentioned the coronavirus because it, it occurs to me that it's rather intriguing that this year we are dealing with a medical virus and we're all running scared. Last year we were dealing with an ideological virus we realise there are steps need to be taken, but we haven't got to the point of washing our hands of it yet. And that came through earlier. And so I think that uh, it's difficult as individuals because sometimes being, being confronted with bigotry is hard to, to, to actually stand up to. But the more that people can do that and call people out, the better. But I think that it's at community, group community levels. I think there are my... My hypothesis would be, and because I haven't been able to test this, it's one difficult to test, but I think I have a, it's a reasonable hypothesis that there are rather too many Christian communities who harbour a negative misperception of Islam, and that to me becomes a seed, seed bed for supporting indirectly extremism. And it came out, for example, in, uh, in 2011 with Anders Breivik, when a noted New Zealand journalist declared shortly afterwards, he expressed what a lot of people were feeling. That is, what a terrible thing it was for this man to go and shoot all these young people and blow up a building. But I can understand why he did it. That was the phrase that really got me. And you picked this up, and of course, there was a brief, I was actually delighted to see that it was uh, suppressed in the media, but there was a brief report just, I think, either yesterday or the day before, that how on March the 15th, the, um, the video of the attack was rescreened on certain channels, the right-wing channels and so on, and people were celebrating it, and that the, the, uh, the terrorist was being hailed as a, as, a, as a hero. From my point of view, all we've had so far is act one of a three-act play. Act two is going to be the uh, trial and how that's handled because that's all part of it, the whole thing. And then act three is what happens afterwards when he becomes a martyr for the right wingers unless you can find a way of neutralising that. So there's, there's a whole lot of ramifications, but I think you're, it was a good question, but it's one we will have to face. How do we actually combat it? Um, I'll give you a few really practical examples. Be mindful with your clicks. Do not click on stuff that you know is inflammatory. Don't click on the material from people that you know regularly aim to inflame. And you know the kind of people I'm talking about. When you're calling out hate online, do not retweet or share the material. So if you want to refute it, refute it without referring to the person or sharing their tweet or the link to their article. Starve it of the publicity. And I'll be talking more about that in my speech. Thirdly, organise. So find like-minded people and work collectively together. Like, the, these issues will not be solved by individual action. They need collective action. So collectivise. 
we all have to stay at home now. Use your Zoom, use your internet. <laughs> You've got plenty of time. <laughs> use it wisely. Fourthly, choose your leaders well. Where you have the ability to choose, be informed and make a wise choice and do not reward the people that use hateful rhetoric with your vote <coughs> or other choosing mechanism. Mm. Right? Um, and I had another one, but I've forgotten. And I will, <laughs> if I remember, I'll, I'll say it. But Great. those are immediately things that you can do right now that will absolutely have an impact. Thank you, Anjan. Do we have one more question on the floor before we go to our next wonderful speaker? No? Okay. Well, with that, I would like to hand over to you, Anjum. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Tena kato katoa ko Anjum Rahman tu kuingoa. Ko atai mai aho kite tautoko te kopapa o teneira. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Manafinua, their history, their struggles, and their aspirations. I'd like to share the following fakatoki, which a friend um, offered to me. Naku te roro no te roro ka ora ai te iwi. With your basket and my basket, the people will live. And this whakatoki is important in this particular time, especially when we all need to be thinking about the collective to ensure that a virus doesn't spread, that we need to join and we need to share. I want to acknowledge the victims of 15th of March, those who passed, the injured, those who were present, and all of their families and friends. That event was an expression of hate. What caused that person to be so full of hate? It's a journey. It doesn't just happen overnight. People don't just decide all of a sudden to pick up a gun and go and shoot people in that fashion. So how does the journey start? As any police officer will tell you, and most wise people will tell you, that major criminal acti activity starts with petty theft. It starts with shoplifting. Those small things that if we don't get to them at the beginning, create, you know, spiral and get worse. And so with hate. It starts with small acts of dehumanisation. When we can start to see other people as a little bit less human. And as always, when you're not the first speaker, the person before you takes part of your speech. <laughs> but let me expand on um, what Professor Pratt has said. <laughs> we start to define people by their faults. Now think of it as an individual. Imagine if a person took the worst things that you did, the times when you were petty, the times when you were mean, the times when you were tired and you lashed out and said something cruel. Imagine if someone collected all of those things and presented them to the world as if that was the whole of you. And there's not a person sitting in here who's not susceptible to that. We have all done things that we aren't proud of, that we know we could have done better. And if someone took those things and presented them as if that was all that you were, because that's what happens to a community. You start with demonising a group and that group's characteristics. And then you start to place the blame of everything that you see that is wrong 
in, in the society that you live in on those people. They're taking your jobs. They're buying your houses. The economic downturn, it's them. The housing crisis, it's them. Anything you can think of, it's them. At the same time, as Professor Pratt did point out, we see in ourselves everything that is good. We hold everything that is virtuous. We ignore our own faults. And because we are the holders of virtue and good, we must protect it. We have to protect what we have from these people who are taking everything away from us, which then leads to fear, it leads to anger, and that is only a step away from violence. There is no doubt that hate is a political tool. Hate gains attention. I like to call it the Trump effect. And it's, it's not just him. It's used in New Zealand. It's used across the world. Say the most outrageous, most hateful thing that you can think of. And it is splashed across the world news. It's somehow, man says something stupid, it's still a news story. I don't know why, but it always is, all the time. And the media will pick it up and social media will pick it up. Wasn't that a terrible thing? He says, oh my God, he's so racist. We pick it up in a negative way. We call it out for what it is. But what happens is that this person gets their message to the people that will respond to it. The amount of free publicity that people who use this technique get is in the tunes of billions of dollars simply because everybody responds, everybody speaks to it. Did you hear what he said today? And it is promoted everywhere. What we have now, of course, is that it's much easier to spread through social media. So, so the viral effect is much, much greater. And we have seen across the world that different social media have been used in different ways in different countries. So, for example, the far right very successfully used YouTube algorithms to win elections in Brazil. Trump has violated every rule of Twitter, every code of conduct that they have, and yet remains online. Facebook was used, and the best example we've seen was the Brexit campaign, how data was misused and how advertising was breaking all their electoral laws. In India, we've seen the RSS and the BJP use WhatsApp as a way to promote their messages. And of course, various groups have used uh, the comment sections of media websites to the extent that most media websites have had to remove comment sections. Make no mistake, all of these campaigns are very, very well organised and they are very well resourced. If you look at the BJP campaign, like if you think we have rich people here, nah. We don't have rich people. India has like really, really, really rich people and they put a lot, a lot of money into those campaigns. But we know that other governments are doing it. We know Russia's involved. I can name you several other governments. That this is organised and well-funded activity. And they are using techniques like bots, which if you don't know what that is, is automated accounts. They are using paid trolls, so people are being paid to be online, to spread hate and disrupt conversations and to change minds, and it works. They wouldn't do it if it didn't work. It has worked in every age, it has worked in every country, that if you give people something to hate and something that is a threat, and you place yourself as the protector against that threat, 
I don't know what it is about the human condition, but we believe it every time. So the question is, how do we change this? I already gave you some practical examples. Um, we know at government level there are things happening like the Christchurch Call, which is bringing together tech companies and governments and civil society organisations in an effect, uh, uh, hoping to effect change. Whether that will be actually successful um, yet remains to be seen. They have been successful in one regard in that there have been several killers who have tried to live stream their uh, mass killings and those have not gone viral. So the hash sharing database and those sorts of things are having some effect. <coughs> and certainly the event in Christchurch and the work of our government has placed a lot of pressure on tech companies, but it is nowhere near enough. I want to um, take the last few minutes, I don't know where I am on time, but I'll try and hurry, um, to talk about what I'm doing in this space. So last year, um, and it started well before last year, we knew that we needed in this country a national strategy on diversity and inclusion. Um, we knew that the government needed to do it. We knew that there were great um, programs and lots of wonderful work happening in the community, but nobody was taking a step back, taking a strategic look at what was needed, how we could do it in a more planned and coordinated way so that it could have greater impact. The government was not interested in any such thing, and after the 15th of March attacks, they appeared to remain uninterested. But I was lucky, lucky enough to connect with uh, some various people who offered to me the chance to develop a national strategy outside of government. And so that is the work that I'm doing now. And as part of that work, we are touring around the country. We're planning to go to 60 towns and cities, and we've already done the first leg of the west coast of the South Island and some of central Otago, basically sitting with groups of people and asking them three very simple questions. When do you feel like you belong in Aotearoa, New Zealand? What is stopping you from feeling like you belong? And what needs to change in order for you to belong? They are very deceptively simple questions. They were designed to be accessible to all sorts of people who have, may have English as a second language, literacy issues, and so on. Um, it is available, uh, survey is available on our website, which is inclusiveaotearoa.nz, um, and I have some cards happy to share afterwards. Next year, we plan to implement the strategy, but I know that I'm out of time, so ha-ha, suspense. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you, Anjum. Um, so in your words, you have said our response must be equally well-resourced and organised. Our communities need to be motivated and united, which requires an ability to negotiate and compromise. So with that, um, any questions from the floor? A tēnā tātou kato, uh, tēnā koe uh, Anjum, uh, mihi atu ki a koe mō tō kōrero he toha toha mai, nō reira kei tu mihi. Um, I've found your presentation very intriguing, um, as I can admit myself that I've fallen to that particular trap of feeding that beast, uh, particular around uh, hate speech that is uh, being blasted across social media um, to do with my people um, and hidden under the uh, auspice of satire. Um, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about and are aware. Um, it is very difficult to deal and walk in that space. and tough to turn a blind eye. Oh, well, not so much a blind eye, but tough to actually, actually try and not respond to that type of comment. 
Um, so, if you can offer a comment to how it was dealt with by, I guess, Māori in the response that they actually turned, or our Māori actually responded to that in a way which they could not sit back and take any longer. Um, we've heard the outcome that's happened in the news of late. However, I understand where you're coming from with, um, you know, your point of view and your perspective and how we should effectively deal with hate speech disseminated through social media. Do you have a comment in terms of the way in which Tangata Whenua responded to that particular satire? Thank you. Um, so the first thing I would say is uh, my, my advice is to not be silent. I think you do respond, right? But the way that you do it is by responding in your own words in a positive way rather than sharing what the person has said. So don't promote what they have said, but certainly build up your social media audience, say what you have to say. In terms of the response to the particular person and the court case and so on, I thought it was a pretty amazing response. <laughs> I fully backed um, the woman who did so. Uh, it was appalling that she was dragged through court in that way and then had to, you know, the, the person just walks away and left her with all the grief, the stress, the cost. Um, it, it, it is actually appalling. Um, I was at the Hamilton Press Club lunch last year and Moana Jackson was uh, invited as the speaker for that event. And the question that I asked him, and this must have been around June last year, and things were still pretty raw. And so as I was asking him, I promptly burst into tears and could barely get the question out. But what I said to him was, we have been dealing with government for what, four or five years? Like actively engaging with government for about four or five years, and I am done. Like, I'm done, I've had it. Like that, that is it, that's me. I can't, you know, I can't deal with this anymore. How is it that your people have managed to keep fighting for 200 years? And how is it that you guys get up generation after generation against governments that are actively hostile against you, that are actively trying to undermine you, um, incarcerate you, take your rights and your property, and yet you all are still here and you're still getting up to fight? And for me, like, this is an example. Like, this should be like when we're teaching our kids in school. This is the history that we should be teaching, that here are people who get up again and again, and you're still here, and you're making gains, and you just keep pushing. And for me, I'm going to cry again, because <laughs> it's, it's something that I really admire, and I wish I had that, and I take a lot of strength from it. And I also want to totoko naitahu, for their work after the 15th of March attack, which was a huge part of the healing and recovery for our community. And even now in the mental health space, it is the Maori providers who are training up Muslim social workers. So, you know, their support and their connection has been so strong. And I have to say, I really, really admire it. Assalamu alaikum Anjum. Um, you mentioned uh, you were going around this, the country. Uh, but since you mentioned Moana Jackson, I was wondering, um, have you touched base with uh, Jeffrey Palmer and Moana? Because they are in a project where they are trying to uh, advocate for a New Zealand constitution. Because we know in New Zealand, we are not protected we are at the mercy of the parliament because there's a this notion in New Zealand of parliamentary, uh, parliamentary supremacy, unlike in the United States. 
uh, it is important for New Zealand to have a codified, written constitution to protect the minorities. So I was thinking inclusive or terror to work with Moana and Geoffrey Palmer because they are going around the country to look for um, ways in which New Zealand could adopt a constitution so that we are not at the mercy of the 200 and something men and women who are in parliament who cannot do anything when minority rights are infringed. Because we have New Zealand Bill of Rights, but it's nothing when the parliament is there. So I was just wondering. Yep. So um, I, I've been given the report that Mo, um, Moana Jackson did from his series of conversations with um, Tangata Whenua communities. And there was to be next Saturday the um, event at the Marae. Um, I've forgotten the name of the events, but they're doing this whole series of w webinars um, around territory and racism, anti-racism and those sorts of things. And they had a full day event there. I'll, I'll be doing a webinar as part of that on Sunday. But um, that was going to be my big opportunity to meet him and talk to him and it's been cancelled, coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> so I will have to await another opportunity, but absolutely. Um, our project is not to replace anything that anyone is doing. It is... At this stage, what we're doing is simply bringing forward the voice of the people in terms of their feelings of belonging. Um, I absolutely agree with you. I remember at least seven or eight years ago, there were consultations done by the government around the constitution, and I went to those. See, my big concern is that the majority of people in this country still are anti territory mm -hmm. and they are anti-minority rights. Let's remember that the United Nations had just put out that compact against migration, which was supposed to protect us, right? That's what was spray-painted on the killer's gun. It was used to kill us. Right? So that's why it's like how we have to be so careful in the space, and that's why collective action and um, working together is so important. And I absolutely support the work they're doing, and I hope that they reach enough people. But it's up to us to carry on that work as well. It's up to us to persuade as many as we can and to speak back when we feel safe to, um, and to stand alongside whenever we can. But uh, yeah, short answer, yes, I would love to connect with them. <laughs> Thank you. That was my timer beating me to it. So the floor is yours, Professor Peter Lynham. Tenakoto Kata, Salam Alikam. Special greeting to you, sir, and what you've been through and what you've survived and what you symbolise. It's very important in discussions like this to remember the dimensions of the pain that hate speech cause and has left indelible marks on our society. What I want to suggest to you tonight is that we are at times in danger of thinking that the solution to the threat of hate speech is effectively to require us all into some kind of political middle ground where we don't express disagreements. In contrast, I think if you listen to the panel carefully, um, in fact, we're advocating that there is an important place for the expression of disagreement and of debate but it's actually teaching the tone and character of the way that debate should be conducted, which is the critical requirement for our generation. And the difficulty is that, you know, take coronavirus. With coronavirus, there's instant things, apparently, well, not quite, but in theory, that you can do as a protection. But the real concern is that there is no simple way to deal easily with the prevalence of hate speech. 
precisely because in our very globalised society, people resort to identity politics in order to secure themselves. Now, I wonder if we don't need to teach instead better ways in which identity can be expressed when we relate to one another. Because I think much of the problem comes from a very, very long history where, let's face it, for many, many centuries, Christians from their territories, Muslims from their territories, and I mean, it's especially an issue for monotheistic religions, I think. But, but it is also true that among the Buddhist and Hindu communities, similar issues have emerged, but they've gone unchallenged because in that space, well, in fact, the culture encouraged you to express your identity and nobody would, of course, dream of challenging you. Today, clearly, we're in a very different place and isn't it wonderful to be in this different place where we are together but we need to be together in our diversity now i say that because i am struck that in western society the model that is often presented today as the solution is the secular model defined as meaning that we shouldn't bring religion or political differences into the place which causes tension or disagreement. But look, this is not in fact going to be constructive in our contemporary society. It is extremely important that I may speak from my Christian convictions to you with your Muslim convictions and that in that disagreement we will find actually growth, not simply of understanding, though I think understanding will grow from that, but also growth of space that we create for each other to live and to prosper and to see our society live and prosper. Now, thinking about the history, so often the story can be told simply from one perspective. So you'll be well aware that you can do a long trail through, uh, this is really Doug's territory, not mine, but a long trail through Islam-Christian relations, and one should really add relations with Judaism as well, because it's equally complex and serious and important. Um, and in each of those cases, there are horrific stories, of course, of abuse and, you know, for the Christian side, the Crusades is the one that always springs to mind among Muslims and Christians. But I wonder if we were to tell the parts of the story where there were relationships, whether we could actually see that, I mean, it's easy enough to understand how the Crusades happened in the most primitive part of Europe. Whereas, meanwhile, in that part of Europe in the east on the, mo the site of modern-day Turkey, I mean, there, Greek Christians and Muslims learned over centuries to work together and to cooperate. And both regarded the behaviour of the Western Christians who arrived as kind of weirdly barbarous in the way in which they responded. But even from Western Christianity, think in the midst of those terrible events, that extraordinary moment when Francis of Assisi set sail across to Egypt to meet the Sultan and to express a relationship in which he wanted to have a religious discussion and he wanted to express love. It's so interesting to know that there is a separate discourse 
that needs to be placed alongside the discourse of disagreement. It's not that Francis was compromising on anything or that the Sultan was compromising on anything. And of course, looking on, one may wonder how they even understood it, and perhaps they didn't really understand each other. But they wanted to find a place where they could listen to each other. And I think that discovering that real historical experience of dialogue might enable us to do what we need to be able to do in our contemporary society. I want to hear my Muslim brothers and sisters speak what is on their heart. I do not want you to feel so pressured by the New Zealand environment you think, well, I really shouldn't say that I believe that Allah is you know, indeed the true and only God. I would want you to have the space to say that, as I would want to have the space to say that there's a real sense in which we are worshipping one God, and there's a real sense in which we have disagreements about our understanding of that. But we will be the better, not for hiding our disagreements, but for showing a model of ways in which that may be expressed faithfully, clearly, honourably, and think what Aunt Jim said about language, <laughs> well expressed, carefully expressed. And that's, I think, the bit that we so much all need to learn. What is a language of clear, appropriate, understanding discourse? Is it too much to hope that, in fact, modelling that may present a positive thing that we may do in the face of large numbers of, well, I mean, Paul's account was depressingly concerning. I, I do not want to go to the dark web and discover the miseries of what people are saying, but I feel the need that we will model appropriate um, uh, ways to express it. I spend a lot of time talking to strange religious minorities. Um, in recent weeks, I've been talking about the Xinjiang Chi, which is the religious sectarian group in Korea, among which the coronavirus has spread. And I found myself on Korean radio stations describing, I'm intrigued that nobody in Korea seems to be the expert, and perhaps nobody dares in that context. And what I've, I then got into, a series of them started writing to me, you see, and, and I tried to explain, not that I got any reply, but you can try to explain that yes, it is a critical point that we all need to consider we may be wrong. And if I approach that conversation in that approach, that I do it within my integrity, but I do it willing to listen to the other, then I think there is some hope that the identity politics, which really is on the rise in almost every direction, will not destroy a society, but create, I think, a model where a society is held together because we believe in the value of people being people of convictions. I have a sore shoulder at the moment. And the uh, physio sold me for uh, an outrageous $9 um, <laughs> this bizarre little spiky ball. And the theory of the spiky ball is that if I can lie on it when I sleep, it, the actual, the irritation of the spikes will, in the end, take that tender, wounded muscle and make it, well, I've probably got the science all wrong, but make it so it's able to function as it should do, you know, able to be responsive, 
able to twist and bend as the body's meant to twist and bend. It's the most horrible experience. <laughs> None of us likes to be in a world where, you know, we are challenged in what we think. But I think we will be infinitely the stronger if we encourage a society where we speak with faithfulness and truthfulness and love to one another. They just wonderful so far. I love it. You've got your hand up already. Ready to go. Great. So before we go to questions, um, so in your words, Professor Peter Lynham, I urge that we need to find a better model of an open society in which we can sp speak faithfully and clearly to each other in ways that are true to our religious convictions, yet build community and stop hate. And with that, I will go to the question on the floor. Uh, Thank you, all of you, for coming. Um, uh, it's a bit of a long-form question, so you know, humor me. Uh, basically, I've been in New Zealand since a child, raised in a Muslim family. Uh, I was young when September 11th happened. Since then, I've basically gotten used to my religion being demonized. It's more or less something that I've learned to tolerate and not particularly respond to. But in the way that I understand my culture, I came to appreciate Western norms, Christian norms, enlightenment values. Uh, Professor Paul Spoonley was talking about classical liberalism. And to me, it's a difficult discussion here because we have this idea of free speech and hate speech. Obviously, in New Zealand and Europe, for example, there is restraints around speech, but I think the fact that we refer to America so often is because it really is where much of our influence comes from. We seem to follow in this stead. And with them, speech is constitutionally protected. So John Stuart Mill made a utilitarian argument for free speech. He said, it's a way for us to discuss any and all ideas, maybe not even ideas that we necessarily agree with. Some ideas might be dangerous, but we are willing to have open discourse. And my question is that what I've seen from the talk about hate speech is that a lot of people on the side of ideas that I oppose seem to think that if there is this hedging of hate speech, that because they can't openly discuss their ideas, that somehow they're right. Somehow we can't tolerate an argument. We can't have a debate. There is nothing to say where they're obviously right. And to me, I want to have the debate. I want to have the discussion. I've seen the data. I've seen the numbers. I have the arguments that I want to make. I think sunlight is the disinfectant. What do you think? Fundamentally, you'll see that I am agreeing with you that I think there is an appropriate space in which we should be able to declare that which is our conviction. Now, this is where uh, uh, Professor Spoonie's reminder that hate speech is pretty clearly defined. That hate speech against, speaks against a person and incites violence or damage to the good of that person. I'm not sure I've got that exactly right. <laughs> I'm happy to have the, the, the specialist. <laughs> but, that is not produced by you saying, but you're wrong about Islam. It's not like that. And I, I, I think it's mighty important that we have these conversations, but we need to do it on the basis of, unfortunately, we've got to commit ourselves to relating at the same time as disagreeing. And this, this is hard work. You know, I wrote about Destiny Church, and I'm, you know, reasonably expert on sort of pondering the sometimes nonsense that Brian Tamaki <laughs> says. But mostly he's speaking from a rational 
basis from within his own framework. And the first step that I needed to have was to understand why he had those concerns, why he felt that way, what was the framework that made it coherent. So I needed to do the process of trying to understand him and then to challenge and disagree, but to do so in a way that was respectful as well. It, it's a very, very difficult <laughs> exercise to get right, but I think something is wrong in the society if you can't appropriately defend that which is precious to you. But be careful how you do that, because the process of doing it may backfire and actually be destructive rather than positive. If we can learn good speech, then that will be constructive, I think. I feel like I've talked too much already, but I just want to make two points. First of all, that whole free speech premise that you talked about didn't include the notion of power. Who has the power to speak and who has the greatest reach? And until we can equalise the power, then everyone doesn't have equal speech, right? And, and the issue that we have, like, say, before the internet, was who had the reach? So I'm thinking soon after 911. And it was, we had, Muslims had no voice in the media, like, literally none. And every commentator in the country was talking about Muslims, and we had no right of response. So it's all very well to say, let them speak so we can apply sunlight to it, but when you don't have the power to apply the counter-argument, which is often the case, then all that is left is their argument. The second point I would make is that, for example, the Southern and Molyneux, but so many other people are not interested in a debate. They are not interested in a contest of ideas. What they are interested in is making money. This is how they sell their video clips and their books and they fill out lecture halls and charge $180, $200 a speaker and so on. For them, this is a money-making exercise. There is nothing that you could say. You could give them all those facts and figures at your fingertips. They are not here to be persuaded. They are not interested in being persuaded. They don't care who is right. They care about how many people they can pay can make pay to come in the door. And in that situation, shining a sunlight is not going to help. Professor Douglas Pratt, did you want to make a comment or? No? Okay, all right. So um, I'm really sorry, we are, we are stretched for time and there are, there are high expectations of the last panelist. I'm expecting poetry. So with that, Professor Edwina Pio. Now, my Harimai, to all people of the heart, the wonderful audience who've been here for a few hours, my distinguished colleagues, starting with the keynote, Professor Paul Spoonley, who influence and impact our nation and each other. Tena kotu, tena kotu. Inga iwi, inga rio, inga monga, inga awa, tena kotu katoa. Katu tahi tatu. Kite mo mahara, itewa mamai o te iwi, norera kanui te aroha. I share the sorrow that this remembrance recalls, and as a nation, we grieve together. The tragic events of 15th March 2019 in Christchurch struck our Aotearoa like a thunderbolt. Turu turu ti au. The world weeps. As the haunting grief casts its dark shadow one year on, I bear witness to faltering dreams, rebuilding dreams, and the infinitely varied aspects of diversity. As many of my previous panelists and the keynote have already alluded to, religious diversity calls for developing a new repertoire to rethink and remold 
are citadels of ideological imperialism, a repertoire, a lexicon, and vocabulary that allows individuals to think and talk about diverse religions in more deep and meaningful ways, and that gives permission for people to bring their sacred selves to all aspects of their experience, yet being mindful of the need to honor the neighbor and stranger in our midst, for we too were once strangers in this land. In fact, religion, which is supposed to help us cultivate the sense of the sacred inviolability of every single human being, often seems to reflect the violence and desperation of societies and to evaporate our common humanity. Once upon a time, there was a young man. A lot of the people who are radicalized tend to be young men, troubled by the balancing of free speech and hate speech. He goes to his tipuna to solve his dilemma. The tipuna answers in her inimitable style, free speech opens doors to plurality. Dialogue for multidimensional perspectives and rationally compassionate actions. But where do we draw the line? How can we address the slippery ground of unfettered hate to ensure a robust public discourse and freedom that is the beating heart of democracy? Freedom and hatred must be conceptualized as a process against a backdrop of geography, history, social, political, and technological contexts. For many, activism and free speech means you are cool. But what kind of activism is the question? Bombing of Muslims, Jews, Christians? Responsibility and balance is necessary for ensuring free speech. And I'm repeating here a number of things that my previous panelists have said. Without dialogue, we have free reign for vitriolic hate speech. Anything goes permissiveness. Building bastions of anti-immigration, as well as anti-white narratives, read a lot of what's being written in the Middle East, for example. Obscenity, vile messages, radicalization, and faith-based violence. Lack of dialogue and lack of rationally compassionate actions can serve as a breeding ground, creating a terrestrial climate and echo chambers to fertilize and foster violence, intimidation, and subversive platforms such as 8chan, 4chan, Gab, and Vought or the dark web that uh, Paul referred to. Online data and news diets are peopled by dark figures. And it is important to understand, and I repeat, that hate crime is a process rather than a discrete event. Extremists use the rhetoric of threat, otherness, and invasion to increase online polarization, including fake news, deep fake, and power to information insurgents. It is noteworthy, and this is from research from the British Journal of Criminology, that although not all people exposed to hate material commit hate crimes, all hate crime criminals are likely to have, at some stage, been exposed to hate material. No doubt, the algorithms used for data mining and data processing, filter, rank, and move individuals towards certain sites. Many internet platforms, code writers, and programmers sign no code of ethics and are not necessarily interested in principles of fairness, objectivity, and civility, notions often deemed as antiquated. Idiotology, in contrast to ideology, in various disguises is constantly recycled, creating a combustible, toxic cocktail of hate and misinformation. 
Stoked by moral outrage and noxious disquiet, it is an unsettling paradox that years of harmonious behavior seem to be wiped out in one fell swoop, and latent stereotypes manifest their ugly face. In many instances, our worst selves have surfaced with the miasma of microaggressions. This toxicity seems to spur diminished faith and hope in humanity's ability and competency to handle increasingly complex, large-scale, ambiguous crisis situations. So hand washing is a physical thing that we can quickly do. But as was mentioned, I mean, how do we hand wash, uh, like Pilate did, for example, um, with reference to hate speech? Social media enables disinhibition, de-individuation, and provides a safe haven and shield for hate speech perpetrators. And of course, lone actors can also be self-radicalized via the internet. This wicked interplay can only subside if we handle threat perceptions with common sense restraint and short, medium, and long-term strategies embellished with pragmatic Kiwi ingenuity. Mori tu, mori ora, mori noho, mori mate. Standing and moving together begets prosperity, whereas idleness and remaining stagnant begets poverty. But permanent change takes time and is an evolving process. There must be a multi-pronged concerted strategy at educational and organizational levels rather than relying solely on our government to initiate changes. We must do what we can within our own span of control. For change can be effervescent, unless buttressed by continuous messages of how to interact with diversity. I want to emphasize a virtuous cycle through conversations, engagement with diverse groups, reflection, and hopefully change. In the enigmatic task of transcending history through a wise praxis, there is the necessity to understand that the particular is woven into the universal. We must remember every day the possibility of fracturing universes where ideological imperialism dominates. We must have reflective stances and accountable actions to create and illuminate our better selves through Kaiti Akitanga, as guardians and inheritors of this planet. It is again poignant to remember that Mori Tu, Mori Ora, standing and moving together, begets prosperity. Therefore, my final message today is, fill your hearts with dreams. Embrace multidimensional perspectives. Act with rational compassion and put back into the kete, or the basket of life, for the privilege of living. And for the miracle of each day in our journey on this beloved earth. Mori tu, mori ora, thank you. Never fail to deliver. Thank you. That was beautiful. That was beautifully said. Um, so with that, if you'd all like to pause for our wonderful panel tonight, who have given us this panel. And uh, I'm really sorry, but we have run out of time. Um, so I will, I'm, I'm sure you guys will stay behind for a little while. And so you're welcome to ask them questions afterwards. But Abdul, can I get you to come? Uh, to the stage, I think you would like to thank them more formally with a gift. Yes? No? Yes? <laughs> can, I, can I invite Andrew and Naomi from our advisory board? They can do the gift. So, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
just sorting out the gifts, guys. Sorry, um, I think they would like you to come here so a photo could also be taken. So maybe if Professor Peer, we start with you since you're on the side. Uh, if you could just, apologies everyone, I should have thought this through. Professor Douglas Pratt, if we could have you. <laughs> so, yeah. Anju, thank you. Sure, I'm sure they'd be more than happy to show you. Um, <laughs> so uh, if I could just request our panellists, um, if you would uh, just stay behind for a photo right after the vote of thanks, we'd like to take a photo with you if that's okay. Um, so with that, if I could pass it back to our lovely MC. Um, thank you to our wonderful moderator, uh, to the panelists, thank you so much for your sharing and the audience for your participation. Um, I'd like now to introduce a peace advocate to this gathering. Farid Ahmad has lived in New Zealand for 30 years. 21 years ago, he became a paraplegic when a drunk driver ran over him. Miraculously, Farid survived, but is now confined to a wheelchair. Farid is a senior leader at the Dean's Avenue Mosque in Christchurch, and he works as a homeopath. Since the attacks, he has been speaking around the world, preaching his message of love and forgiveness. Um, I'd like to call upon Mr. Farid Ahmad, please, to say a few words. وما توفيقي إلا بالله عليه توكلت وإليه ونيب. In the name of Allah, the kind, the merciful, and uh, without Him giving me ability, I cannot deliver anything. So my prayer to Him to give me few ideas to talk from my heart. All the eminent scholars and wise audience. Assalamu alaikum. So I'll try to be brief because for wise people only hints is enough. <laughs> so you are wise people and I'm just an ordinary person. I will probably talk about the whole thing into my personal journey and you can uh, you know, get some ideas that how I think and how I believe that most of us should think. But I will refer to me 
instead of we. Because I believe if I don't do something, then I have no right to ad advise others to do the same thing. So the practice has to start from me. So the fact is, the hate is there. It is not only in a religious area, but husband hates wife, <laughs> wife hates husband, some children they hate parents, some parents they hate children. So hate is everywhere. And the opposite is also everywhere, which is love. But what I see, I see the love is more than the hate. I saw one hate in Christchurch, but I saw billions of love all, over, all around the world. So what I had done in my journey, the hate took my wife away. And I'm a victim. I'm suffering. It took my 50 other friends away. And I'm also traumatized because of their loss. So I had decided to continue my journey with few things. So I'll make only a few points. Number one, I decided to have peace in my heart. And this is my choice. And haters cannot take my choice away. There can be hates all over me, all around me, above me, beside me. But if I choose that I want a peaceful heart, then no one can take it away. So I had chosen to have peace in my heart. How? Number one, I surrendered my fate to my God. I accepted whatever happened, it happened, and I had to move on. Number two, I decided to be patient. Without patience, peace goes away. I decided to control my anger. Without controlling my anger, I won't have peace in my heart. I decided to fill up my heart with love, not with hate. So no matter how many people hated me or my wife, we decided we will not hate them back. I decided to use my wisdom to look at the bigger picture, to look at the benefit in this life and in next life. And all these things help me to restore the peace in my heart. And I believe if that resonates with you, then we all should make sure whatever is happening outside, whatever other people are doing to me, but choice is ours. Do I want peace in my heart? It is my choice. So we have to choose that one. So this is number one, peace in the heart. The second thing is I had chosen to be positive. And as I said, the way I look at only in one house there is fire. And I don't want to focus only in this house and thinking, oh, the whole world is in fire. I want to look at right, no fire there. I want to look at above, no fire there. I want to look at behind me, no fire there. Still the world is big enough some incidents of hates, some people are haters. But in this world, in this country, I see most people don't hate one another. So when I see some people are hating, for my comfort, I look at the people who do not hate. 
and that gives me comfort. And I see most people are peaceful. So I have chosen to be positive, not to, not to be negative. I have, with my religious faith, I have seen or I, I, I have found out that we did not lose. The people who were martyred, I, I see in my Quran it says that they are in paradise. They are not losers. They are gainers. Victim like, like us, Quran says, if you be patient and control your anger, then God will help you. And I'm doing this. I'm not a loser. Our neighbors, non-Muslims in my city, who came rushing with love, they are not losers either. Because now they have built up a reputation. The whole world is admiring them. The New Zealand in general and the government, they came whatever they could do. First of all, I would say thank you before I complain against anyone. The New Zealand, the way they have shown compassion, they did not lose. The hater thought they will be, they, he will break the econ economy. The hater thought that he will bring the division. The hater thought that he will destroy the reputation of New Zealand. He was the loser. Nobody is taking flower to him. Majority people are sticking not to the hate, but to the law. So I have to see positive. And I have decided to think positive and to inspire other people to be positive. So this is my second point. First one, have peace in heart. Second one, be positive. Third one. I focused on my duties. What can I do? Before I ask the government what they should do, before I ask other people what they should do, what can I do? I have to start something from me. Because my God is going to question me, Farid, what did you do? Government will ask the, you know, God will ask the government what they have done. I'm not the government. So I started thinking, what could I do? And the immediate thing, Quran taught me, I'll recite it, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Idfa'a billati hiya ahsan. Fa'iza allazi baynaka wa baynahu adawatun, ka'annahu waliyun hameem. This verse is in chapter 41 in Quran. That when you see something evil, your duty is to do opposite, do good. And if you can patiently continue doing the good, then the one who is treating you as enemy one day, most likely, that person will become your friend. So I thought that is my duty. He gave me hate, I would do opposite. I would give him love. He was cruel, and I'll show him mercy. He was killing, I'll not kill him. And that is the start of my duty. And that's what I had done. I remember the story of Prophet Joseph. Prophet Joseph, he was sold to Kenya by his own brothers as a slave. They planned to kill him, but he did the opposite. When he had power, he did not kill them. He went as an immigrant, and he suffered a lot, but he was positive. He was peaceful. And the most importantly, he was practicing his morality. He was continuing doing good, and then one day, he won the hearts of the Egyptians, and they made him a ruler. We are immigrants. I believe I'm an immigrant. If New Zealanders go to my country, my people will not say, welcome. They will say, Barra, get out. Why are you coming here? I see, you know, compared to that, New Zealand is much better. They have welcomed me. They opened their heart, 
hearts for me. Yes, there are some bad apple in every basket. But most people, they embraced us. And look at here. And look at, you know, the people of the land, the Maoris, you know, they do not hate us. Most people do not hate us. Some people do, but we need to win their hearts. Yes, we can take some laws and actions about this, but with law and legislation, you cannot legislate people's heart. The more you put people into prison, the more you make them popular. Because they think we are being repressed. For who? For these immigrants. So hate them more. And then the blame come on us. That for us, they are in prison in their own land, in their own country. We have to step up. Each and every immigrant, I believe, and this is my duty part. I believe my duty is, as an immigrant, I have to do as much as possible to reach their heart and to show that I love them, to show that we contribute. Yes, some people are saying, you know, immigrants are taking our job away. We should also say in return, together, unitedly, this, 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 this contribution we are doing. For our link, New Zealand is earning billions of dollars from meat industry. From this, from that, from that. We should put our part. And most importantly, I should not be afraid. Because I'm a believer. I believe I was born to die. So whenever my time will come, I'll die. I'm not afraid of anyone. I'm here to do a job. And my job is only continuously doing my, my duty. And my duty, again, is I have to show I'm righteous. I have to prove that I'm loving, and I have to help people. And sometimes when I give talk in the mosque, I say, how many people we are here in the congregation? 500. OK. If each one of us decide that we will make 10 friends from our neighbor, then we will make 5,000 friends. And these 5,000 friends will talk about us. Hey, don't hate Muslim. They are actually good people. Because they made us friends. They invite us. They look after us. This, this sort of things. So by good action, we can win people's heart. Sometimes not necessarily by legislation, by policing, by prison, etc., etc. So I have taken that path. But I'm not, I'm not against the law. Don't misunderstand me. I'm just saying that beside the law, we, have, we should have human-to-human -human connection, human-to-human -human communication. I advised my fiancé leaders that when Brian Tamaki says something, pay respect to him. Give him a call. Hello, brother. We want to come to your church for a cup of tea. If you don't do this, let me do this. I can do this. I'm sure if we have Kapiti once, twice, many times, we'll become friends. We'll find some common grounds. Last point, because I don't want to take too much time from you, and my text is waiting aside. <laughs> so he will charge me the waiting fee. <laughs> so last point is, Effort for unity. We live in the plural society. As a Muslim, alone I am not enough. As a Christian, alone you cannot bring peace. It is not possible. We need everyone. We need people with faith. We need people without faith. Because in New Zealand, about 50% people, they don't have faith. So when we say, you know, that, you know, interfaith, some of them, they said to me in one gathering, one, uh, you know, gentleman, he stood up and he said, Mr. Ahmed, what is for me? What can I take from tonight? I said, explain, please. 
He said, I don't believe in any God. And you people are talking about God and religion. What is for me? So I recited a verse from the Holy Quran from chapter 59. And I said, you are my human brother. Thank you. I love that. He was very, very happy. So we have to extend our message of unity to everyone. That look, we are human. And we all agreed that we are human. And we should consider one another as brothers and sisters. And let us treat one another with love and compassion. This is not a big thing to ask. No one can argue. All right, let's begin you know, with this one. So I have been going around with my little ability here and there, believer, non-believer. Anywhere I get the chance, I go, I communicate, and I say, let us work together. Let us make this place you know, safe. Let us make our next generation's future safe. And if all of us, if we do whatever capacity we have, if you are a politician, influence in politics. If you are an academic, teach your students. If you are a, 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 you know, a, a social leader, use your talent. If you are just ordinary like me, have some you know, more friends. Each one of us, if we do a little to, or, you know, to communicate and unite and connect, that let us make our New Zealand safer. Then together, we can bring a change. So I will finish with one note, and that is a, a poem in Bengali. It says, Megdeketura Korishne boy, Alaletar Shod Johashi. Do not be afraid of looking at the cloud. Look beyond. Because behind it, the beautiful sun is smiling. So let us hope for the best and let us be active. You know, then inshallah, you know, God willing, the better things is coming for us. May Allah forgive all of us. May Allah grant us ability to uh, do more work for the peace and harmony and in spreading love, and may Allah grant the paradise for those who have been martyred in Christchurch. Amin. Assalamu alaikum. Yes, thank you so much for that ins inspiring and certainly very insightful um, sharing, Brother Farid Ahmad. We've got a token of appreciation for you from the Pearl of the Island Foundation. Right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are approaching the conclusion of this evening. I'd like to invite co-chair of the Religious Diversity Centre, uh, Jocelyn Armstrong, um, to say the vote of things. Tēnā koutou katoa. Salam, shalom, peace be upon us all. It's simply my task now to draw our feelings of thankfulness together. I want first to thank on behalf of the Religious Diversity Centre, the uh, Pearl of the Islands organisation for your hard work and your organisation that's brought us together tonight. A big thank you. Our thanks to Karia, who has, moder who has uh, been our mistress of ceremonies tonight. <laughs> and to Tabor for her moderating of that wonderful panel. Haven't we been 
fortunate tonight. What a treat we've had. I want to thank Paul and Peter and Anjum and Douglas and, and Edwina. I hope you realise that your hours of research, your hours of writing, your hours of imagining and dreaming, your hours of standing up for justice and speaking out are appreciated. And they lead us, they give us leadership. And we rely on that, don't we? So thank you all very much indeed. And thank you, Farid, Brother Farid, for the depth of your spirituality and your compassion. I rather wish it was your words finishing this evening, but we do need to say thank you. So what's the challenge for us as we leave this room? I want to think of us going out there into the streets of Auckland, into the supermarket, and into our neighbourhoods, as individuals, as peoples, as uh, members of communities and families. And so, since bad w events start with words, can we each of us strive to respond to the words that denigrate, the words that put down somebody else's religious practices and beliefs, words of prejudice and bigotry that hurt, the words of hate? Can we learn to respond with words that tell a different story? I learned last week that if I hear someone saying, oh, it's illegal what they're doing, it's illegal. Don't respond with those words, respond with, oh, did you know that it was legal for something, something, something? Do you get it? Come back with the opposite. Think of our language as we heard tonight. And so the more that we can do this in our daily lives, the more we build up a New Zealand community that's got no room for hate. Wouldn't that be wonderful? But let's get there. We can do it together, pulling it together, as our panellists have said tonight. Um, I'm sorry that there aren't more Pākehā here tonight because one of my beefs as I speak with groups of people now is to really ask people to open up the conversation. And I want everyone to help New Zealanders like me who've learnt over the, the, over the years that you don't just talk about religion, help us to share something, help us to talk about the human values, Let, help us to talk about the spirituality. And that allows the people whose lives are full of it and they want to talk about it, that will allow that dialogue to happen between us. Do you get what I'm getting at? Yes. Do you understand it? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. So, it's talking together. We need to be the best we can for each other. My husband George found a new word this year, uh, this week. I think it came from Canada. Caremongerers. And then he, he invented another word. And so he helped me tonight with this sentence, let us all leave this place to be caremongers and sharemongers, to counter any scaremongering that may easily arise in our midst. So join me in thanking our speakers. And if you want any help to get people talking together, talk to me about our Religious Diversity Centre workshops and dialogues and meetings. We can help. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Jocelyn. Ladies and gentlemen, um, with your presence and your support, the Pearl of the Island Foundation is encouraged to promote goodwill and protect the freedoms and privileges that we enjoy here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Let me now invite Matua Jeff to close the event. Uh, sorry, uh, he, left, he left. I'll close the event. Thank you so much for coming, everyone. 
I'd like to bid you good night, peace and goodwill to all. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Please and blessings to everyone. Thank you.